Hello and welcome everybody. Um, my name is Steve Teresi, the Director of Training and Technical Services at JL Audio. Um, I'm located in Southern Florida, just a couple of miles north of our main facility in Miramar, Florida. And I have with me Mr. Kevin Ferry, who's up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, not too far from Bethlehem, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Kevin. How's it going, everybody? <laughs> we are a little farther apart. When I used to live uh, outside of Philly, it was closer to, to Bethlehem. PA guys, what am I going to do with you? <laughs> Over in Southern California, I have Mr. Rob Haynes joining us today. Say hello, Rob. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, so just as a quick reminder, anyone that's joining us via WebEx over on the right hand side of your window, you should see the chat window. If you don't, if you move your mouse around the main screen, you'll see a couple of bubbles show up. One of them looks like a chat icon. Click that and you'll see the chat open up on the right hand side. Kevin and I will be minding that chat as well as the chat on Facebook, which I'll come to in a moment. If you want to get in touch with Rob, he will not see this chat until after he's done with his presentation. So let Kevin or myself know what you need, and we'll either fire it over to Rob by interrupting him, which we will do, um, or uh, we'll save that for at the end and kind of do a little recap of questions. As for the Facebook Live, we are streaming live on Facebook, and uh, there is a bit of a lag between what we're presenting and what they'll see over on Facebook. So Kevin and I will keep an eye out on the chatter there so you can post your comment questions over in the, the Facebook group there. And we'll also respond to those as we can or uh, put those over to Rob. So uh, just a quick reminder about the whole idea here is these are web-based trainings that were designed specifically for this delivery mechanism. So we can stream it live and have some chat and uh, interact with everybody. But we're also very sensitive to your time and realize that sometimes it's difficult to get away for much more than about 45 minutes or so. So we try to structure these sessions to last about 30 to 45 minutes and we do pretty good at getting to that. Um, the question and answer at the end is always welcome and we encourage that. Um, so without further ado, let's uh, turn it over to Rob, who's going to present for us today. Rob, take it away. All right. Thanks, Steve. Let me just uh, get my screen share up and running here so you guys can see the keynote and we'll be good to go. All right. So you should see an agenda on the screen, hopefully. Um, so thanks for joining everyone. Um, this is a session I'm really excited about. Uh, it's going to walk you through the the proper steps to properly set up an amplifier and make sure we have it configured properly. And uh, what we're gonna do today is discuss uh, why it's important that we have a properly set up amplifier. We'll go through some of the initial configuration options you'll find in the JL Audio family of amplifiers. And then we'll walk through the steps of setting filters and properly setting levels. Um, so again, this is a training I'm kind of excited about because it's a, it's a hands-on training. And you know we're gonna talk a bit about some physics and science and even do some math at one point but it's all gonna be easy you gonna be Rob, you're gonna talk physics and math with people nobody likes that stuff just us no. <laughs> i promise to keep it entertaining I'll, I'll keep it bill nye science guy level how does that sound i love it <laughs> all right so with that said let's let's discuss why it's important that we have properly set up amplifiers and there's a couple reasons for it First of all, it's gonna make sure that we really get the best audio performance in terms of both output and fidelity. Uh, an improperly set up out amplifier, it may limit the output potential, which means it's not gonna be as loud. And if we're distorting or running into other issues, it's gonna affect the sound quality because we're not getting the true results of the music. And we'll discuss why as we go through. Some other th issues that may pop up with improperly set up amplifiers are increase in current draw, which could cause issues with the charging system, especially when we get into heavily clipping, heavy clipping. And when we look at some images on clipping, you're gonna be able to see why that could potentially pull a lot more current. And of course, you know, it's gonna yield more reliable results. And that really comes down to not also damaging the products. And that's kind of what I wanna focus on first is a properly set up amplifier while it will also protect itself, it's also gonna reduce the potential failure of speakers. And typically when we have a speaker come back to JL Audio with a, it's defective, defective in quotes, it's typically from either misuse, abuse, amplifiers not set up right, or a combination of all of those. And typically when the speaker comes, say what Steve? I said it's very true. I, I, I love, you know, you did the, the whole thing in quotes. When, when speakers come in for warranty, that means there's some kind of a defect. And invariably, it's a burnt or melted voice coil. 
I'd like to know where in our production facility do we add that kind of heat to have too much heat to melt the coil? You know, obviously this is not something that we did. It's probably related to what Rob's talking about, some kind of setting or something else in the system that's causing this failure. It's not a manufacturer's defect. So typically when we have a speaker come back that's broken, uh, there, there's usually two, two issues that come into play. Uh, the main one are failures related to over excursion. The speaker was driven beyond its mechanical limits. It's moving more than we designed it to. And that typically means stuff like torn surrounds, the fabric underneath the speaker cone that acts as the suspension, that fabric gets torn. Uh, the, your, the spiders, uh, I'm sorry, the surrounds on the, it's been a long day. The surrounds on the top of the speaker. <laughs> so either the rubber or foam surround around the cone. Yeah, still part of the suspension. That will either tear or, uh, you know, get ripped. The spiders, which is the cloth fabric underneath the cone that works with the surround to help the speaker move up and down and stay on the right path. That can get torn or it'll start to fatigue where you'll actually start to see it sag a little bit. It's not as stiff as it was designed to be. The lead wires, the copper wires that go from the uh, your terminal points to the voice coil, those can rip or start to fray if they move too much. And always the glue joint failures, especially around the, the meat and potatoes of the speaker, that voice coil former cone area where everything comes together. Even though we do a pretty good job at JL Audio with a lot of our key technologies in that area, if you overdrive it, if you beat that speaker past what it's designed to do, that's a very delicate area and that could break. So when we see these mechanical failures that I just mentioned, you know, the speaker is being pushed beyond what it was designed to do. Now, another issue that we'll see are heat related failures. These are where Steve was joking around the, about the coils where there's so I'm much joking. <laughs> well, joking, but about what we see as defective. <laughs> Um, but yeah, this is where we run so much heat through the copper on the coil that it starts to burn and it delaminates. And instead of a nice copper coil, we have a copper slinky. The lead wires burn, which then limits the current that can flow through the wires to the coil. We see separation, too much heat, which causes the glues or adhesives to gas out. And then you have separation in all of those key areas from heat. So these are some major problems with speakers, and it could be from many causes, especially on the mechanical side. It could be from too large of an enclosure. It could be from improper installation. Um, even on heat, you could have a properly set up amplifier, but if we're running way more power than what the speaker is capable of handling, that extra heat from the extra power could cause that. So there are many factors that go into speaker failure, but what I really wanna dial into are the ones that are related to setup. So even if you have a perfectly set up amp, if you don't install it right, if you don't have a proper enclosure size or design, uh, if you have too much power for what the speaker's rated, uh, you could have these failures. But if a smart design with proper setup, we should mitigate a lot of these issues. So the first thing I wanna talk about, the importance of setting up is filters. So a filter, um, and Steve had a good uh, discussion about this in our uh, one of our DSP sessions uh, previously, and I like that how he described that a filter is the process of holding back elements or modifying the appearance of something. And uh, he actually uses a great analogy because he's a coffee snob. So of course he had to put a coffee filter into it. So if you think about a filter and, and coffee filter, and I hope I don't butcher this, Steve, so I fr please forgive me if I do. But if you think about it, you have your... Yeah. You have your nice coffee beans that you've pulled from the soil that has special soil and fertilizer and all the stuff that makes it the snooty coffee that Steve likes to drink. You grind it up, you throw it in your coffee filter, the hot water goes through, and then it passes. And then what passes is, as Steve calls it, the elixir of the gods, coffee. So that's what you want. That's the, what passes through. And what you don't want to pass through stays in the filter and you throw it away. That's kind of a great analogy as to how high pass and low pass filters work. Because if you think about a high pass filter, it's holding, if we have a full range signal coming into it, 20 to 20,000 Hertz, it's holding back the low frequencies. So wherever the filter is set at, it says anything above this, you can pass below it. You're not allowed to pass just like the coffee beans, the ground up uh, coffee is not allowed to pass through the filter. Only the liquid does. 
So that's a cool analogy when you start to think about high pass and low pass filters. Additionally, on the low pass filter side, it's gonna hold back the high frequencies. Only the frequencies below that filter point are gonna be able to play. And anything above it is gonna be blocked from going to that specific speaker. And then of course, there's also band pass filters, which is a combination of both low pass and high pass. So you're gonna hold down everything below the high pass, you're gonna hold down everything above the low pass, and you're only gonna get the chunk of frequency in the middle, or the pass band pass, pass band of the, uh, of the uh, spectrum right there. So a uh, cool way to kind of think about filters. Everyone, I always, when I first started getting into audio, just thought, you know, oh, crossover. A crossover stops frequencies. Well, no, that's actually what a filter does. And a crossover is actually when we combine two filters together, like if we were using a low pass for a, a subwoofer and a high pass for a mid bass driver. So this is why uh, it's important we get these set up. But I'm gonna show a couple cool charts here, and this is why it's really important when we look at a high pass filter on a mid range or a six and a half inch speaker, uh, probably in your doors. So we have a chart here. On the bottom, we have our frequency response. Left to right, it's 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. So low frequency to high frequency. Going up and down, we have our amplitude. How loud is it? Higher is louder, lower is less loud. So let's say we had a full range signal coming in and it's equal loudness or equal energy across the entire spectrum here. So 20 to 20,000 hertz, we're at the exact same amplitude. So let's say we have a six and a half inch speaker in the door and it's moving X at 100 hertz. And we'll just say X is a quarter of an inch. So at, a at 100 hertz, this speaker is gonna move a quarter of an inch to put out the same amount of energy as the rest of the frequencies. Now, where this comes into play is when we start to drop octaves. And if you're not familiar with what an octave is, it's a halving or doubling of a frequency. So if I move one octave down from 100, that's 50 hertz. But when we lower an octave, to maintain that same output potential, one octave down, the speaker has to move four times as much. So if our speaker is moving a quarter of an inch to play X amount of dB at 100 hertz, it has to move an entire inch to have that same output potential at 50 hertz. And if we drop another octave, we now have to move four inches to have that same output at 25 hertz. Not from that six and a half round. No, <laughs> that's where those mechanical failures come into play. And it's probably gonna happen right off the bat. And that's why we have these larger subwoofers and why we wanna cross stuff over. The lower the frequency, the more the speaker's gonna wanna move. That's why tweeters are so small. At those higher frequencies, they don't have to move as much. So we can make them smaller and control the, uh, the movement on them. And this is really where the high pass filters come into play. And the reason for that is when you set a high pass filter, so let's put a high pass filter at 80 hertz. When you see the filter kick in, you're gonna notice it doesn't actually start to roll off at, at 80 hertz. Uh, this is a 24 dB Linkwitz Riley, and at 80 hertz, where the filter is set at, it's actually gonna be six decibels down. And that's a significant cut, because if you know the 3 dB rule, 3 dB down or up, is a doubling or having a power. So at three dB down from where our equal amplitude is, we've already cut the power in half. And then at 80 Hertz, it's cut another half. And the six dB swing is pretty big. So you can see how quickly by minimizing power, we're limiting the amount of excursion on the speaker. And this is why we use high pass filters and why they're very um, helpful when it comes to limiting the excursion of the speaker and making sure that they're not playing frequencies they're des not designed to play. And I, I've seen setups where, you know, oh, we'll, we'll just lower the low pass filter a little bit more to get a little bass out of the speaker. And yeah, you can do that maybe, but you also are getting into the danger zone because you're asking that speaker to move a lot more. Even though that's not a full octave down, we're still asking, you know, upwards of maybe two times the movement. Is that speaker still capable of doing that? So you really have to get smart, you know, when you set your filter points and really know what your speakers are designed to handle. What are their excursion capabilities? Same thing on the tweeters. These high frequencies, it's a lot of small movement. When we get into the lower frequencies, it's not moving as quick, but it needs to move more. 
So we got to make sure also on the tweeter side of things, if we're going passive, that we have a properly set high pass filter as well. And here you can kind of again see how the band pass setup works. We have high pass and low pass filters uh, together and both 6 dB down where the filter frequency is set at, which in this case is a high pass filter at 500 hertz and a low pass filter at 5000 hertz. And we're only getting the information between 500 and 5000 essentially with a bit of roll off in that area. And I would, don't worry about the roll off because when you combine other filters together, and that's why we like to use Linkwitz Riley filters, they'll actually electrically sum flat and you'll be back to that nice flat line when we start combining those different channels together. So that's the importance when it comes to using filters and why we want to have them set on our amplifiers and DSPs if we're going active. Now let's start talking about levels here. So I'm, we're going to look at a sine wave and the reason why we want to use sine waves for level setting and why they're also great for discussions like this is it, it's constant. Music's very dynamic. Um, you know, music when it leaves an amplifier, essentially it's AC electricity, it's voltage. So it's going to go up and down, up and down, but it's very dynamic as the frequencies aren't the same. So with a sine wave, it's always going to be the same because it's a consistent frequency. So if you look at this chart here, um, the way I like to look at it, those black dashed lines going across, there's two of them, that's kind of the power limit. That's the power range of the amplifier. Anything between those dashed lines, that's what it's designed to do. And as we turn up our power, we're going to hit, if you look at the line as the sine wave, as it goes from left to right, it gets larger. That's great. Our amplitude's getting more. It's louder. But we are going to get to the point where the amp has hit its maxed output potential. And when that happens, that doesn't stop the increase in the wave because the wave is still getting bigger as we turn it up. But the amplifier is not going to be able to complete that wave anymore because it's hit its limit. And you'll start to notice those red dashes that's the bigger wave, but the amp can't produce it. Essentially, it's getting clipped. That's why we call it clipping. Yeah, see? So what we end up with, it's not, not necessarily a square wave because it's not, the time is never up down. There's always gonna be a bit of a delay, but those blue flat spots you see, that's what clipping is. And instead of having a complete wave, we have a lot of energy now, uh, a lot of average energy, a lot of average heat, that's now going to our speakers and that increases the heat on the coil. And this is really where we see coil failures. You know, everyone jokes, oh, you're not clipping if you're not trying. A little bit of clipping is not bad on subwoofers, but clipping like what we're seeing on the right, that's asking for voice coil failure because that is a lot of heat and a lot of energy. And if that's a mid-range speaker, it's also going to sound horrible because now we have distortion. We're not getting all the, the, the frequencies or sound that we're looking for. Yeah, Steve. Just wanted to, to point out that a lot of people think that the, the red dashed line is what's causing the problem for speakers, that the clipping is causing excessive high frequency stuff and all this other stuff. That stuff doesn't affect a low frequency driver. It may do damage to a tweeter. But what Rob's talking about here is imagine if you just look at the blue shape as it goes to the upper portion and then down to the lower portion and then back up. If you shaded in that area, if you just fill that in with blue, for example, the amount of blue you see is the equivalent of the amount of power that's going through the speaker at that point. And the amount of power is also the amount of heat that's being generated. So as you start increasing that flat area across the top, you're just getting it water and water. It's basically, it's creating more and more heat over a longer and longer period of time. And as Rob said, that's, that's not asking for a problem. That's almost guaranteeing a problem. You know, that's why we want to make sure that you set your levels on your amplifier correctly so that you can get maybe just a little bit of those little red dash lines showing up, so to speak, and just a little bit of the flatness. Um, and for a subwoofer, you might be all right, but be careful as you start getting into the higher frequency drivers. They're less able to deal with that kind of situation. So that's you know, the whole point of the, the, the session here is what Rob's talking about right here is to be able to control a lot of this depending on what you're hooking up to it. Sorry to interrupt you, Robert. I like this chart a lot. So. Yeah, that was a great point. You know, we also talked a little bit earlier about the increase in current and how that could cause issues with your charging system. If you look at the, uh, we'll say the the third or fourth, you know, uh, cycle there, either before or just a little bit of clipping, you could see the peak power. It's very minuscule. It hits it and then it, you know, goes back down. When you get to the far right, that is 
consistent peak power. That is a lot of power. So now that amplifier is pulling more current to be able to put out that. So we have more strain on the charging system. We have a lot of heat going to our speakers and we're getting really bad sound. You hear it, it distorts and you hear mechanical issues with the speakers. It sounds just awful because we're losing a lot of key content that the amplifier just physically can't reproduce anymore. So this is why we want to make sure we have our levels set and why when we see heat or, you know, slinky coils or coils blowing, it's not a defect. It's not the speaker design. Most cases, it's from amplifiers overclipping because the levels haven't been properly set. Twice you said the word slinky. I just want to make sure everyone understands what you mean by that. A voice coil is basically a bunch of wires wound around each other on a like a voice coil or something that holds it all together. When you have excessive heat, you can break down the glues that hold all that together and those wires come off and it looks like that old toy that the slinky, which is basically a giant coil of wire. So that's what Rob's referring to. And I think he's got something to show you a slinky. So now here's a coil here. So you can see all the copper that's wound around this. So when it gets too hot, it'll turn black and then it'll get to the point where it almost like explodes and all these tightly wound wires look like a slinky in your hand. So, you know, this is what we want it to look like. And when we have too much heat, that's when we start to see issues with the copper on the coil here. So, so two, things, <clears throat> two things, one, I want to add that, you know, when you start getting into those scenarios where you have a lot of, um, clipping going on your your voltage and, and current that it's drawing from the system eventually if not fairly quickly the uh, rails on the amplifier are going to start to sag right and then that's going to cause some distortion on your outputs also and your sub is just constantly going and going and going and going and it never has a breather there now like Steve said, it's not quite so much the distortion. There's actually a giant piece on that uh, subwoofer structure that helps filter out some of that stuff, right? <laughs> and uh, where with smaller speakers, it, it's not as big. Um, so you can have some, a little bit of clipping in there, but you don't want to do it to where it is really driving everything into the ground. And that was Chris's uh, question. He just said, is it is it better to maintain a setup to ensure no clipping occurs with a subwoofer setup? You made it sound like a little is desirable. Um, <laughs> I, I, it's a tough word, <laughs> that desirable <laughs> part there. So here's the thing is if, if you set up an amplifier or, or amplifiers in a system to never clip ever, you might be really disappointed with the overall level of output because we've come to be so familiar with systems that do clip, that we do overdrive um, at least a little bit, that we've come to expect a little bit of it. And fortunately in most subwoofer systems, you can't really hear the amplifier when it's getting into trouble. So uh, I don't wanna say it's desirable, but I would say it's more acceptable, especially on a subwoofer for something a bit more robust. Now, bear in mind that when you do clip, when you do run into the clipping situation, there is harmonic content that is, is being created. But a subwoofer, like Kevin kind of referred to, there's a, there's a big coil on a subwoofer, and a coil is basically an inductor. And an inductor helps filter out high frequency. So the high frequency distortion that happens at clipping isn't really going to affect the subwoofer, but it will affect a smaller driver, like a mid-range or a high frequency driver. So clipping for higher frequency drivers is more damaging because of that distortion, and of course the increase of uh, of average power so that's kind of a double whammy on those which is why tweeters can pop pretty quickly when you screw things up but subwoofers being a bit more robust you can get away with it so i i'm only concerned about the word desirable because people are going to say all right they told me to clip it like crazy no 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 not like crazy just a little bit you know maintain it a little bit and um you know the joke that we have to make is you know if you're not clipping you're not trying you gotta have a little bit you know in most applications a little bit's okay now, the, the sort of other conversation that I don't want to kill Rob's time because I know it's a little, a little tight. Um, if your subwoofer is very, very high quality, sometimes that clipping is going to show up. You'll, you'll be able to hear it. Uh, most subwoofers have enough you know, distortion just in the, its normal operation. Not that it's objectionable, but it has enough to mask what's happening on the amplifier side. But when you start getting into some of the really high-end, high-quality subwoofers, the, the noise of the amplifier clipping can become audible and it doesn't sound very good. 
So just be careful. And so I'm not going to let you use the word desirable. I will let you use the word acceptable. How's that? <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> All right. So a uh, couple of housekeeping items before we actually get into setting filters and input sensitivity levels. Um, all JL Audio amplifiers do have uh, usually a couple of um, setup options uh, when it comes for either turn on or how many inputs we're using. Uh, so let's take a look at those real quick. We're actually going to use the top plate of an M800 slash 8V2. Um, XD800 slash 8V2 for the car world. Uh, essentially, um, Hardware wise, almost the same, but you're going to find essentially these same options on just about any JL audio amplifier out there. Um, so a couple things that you need to know when you set up your amplifier is how is the amplifier going to turn on? You need to know where your input sensitivity controls are. Um, some models you'll have a low and high level switch and we'll break down what each of these are in just a moment, as well as your input sensitivity potentiometer for each channel pair or uh, each channel if it's a mono amplifier. We need to know what is what are our inputs going to be? Do we have two, four, six, eight pairs of inputs for however many outputs we have on the amplifier? And then of course we have our filters where you're going to have uh, your potentiometer where you're going to dial your frequency in and then uh, depending on the model of amplifier the option for a uh, high pass, low pass or even band pass if it's on a five channel XDV2 amplifier. So let's break down each of these real quick. Turn on mode is how the amp knows how to wake up. So if you have a aftermarket source unit or a factory uh, audio system that has a dedicated 12 volt remote turn on trigger, um, that's what a remote turn on would be. It's kind of the standard. That's what we've pretty much always had on amplifiers um, as far back as I can remember. That way they're not permanently on and killing the battery when the car is not running. But not all vehicles have that ability nowadays. As more and more cars are becoming complex, we're dealing with CAN bus and fiber optic data systems. We don't always have a true 12 volt trigger. So that's where DC offset and AC signal sensing options are nice. Um, factory systems, even though, as I mentioned earlier, music comes out as AC voltage, there's always a bit of DC offset out of the amp as well. So when the analog inputs on the amplifier detect any DC signal, when set to DC offset, that's gonna wake the amp up and keep it on as long as it's detecting DC. And when that factory source is gonna turn off, that DC goes away, then the amp turns off. Signal sensing works kind of the same way, except it's gonna use AC voltage. Now the downside to that is when you turn the volume down, turn it all the way down or to a very low level, there's probably not gonna be enough AC voltage now to want, make the amp wanna stay awake, so the amp turns off. Not the end of the world. When you turn your radio back up, it'll turn back on, but it might not be as quick as you would like. Where with offset voltage, there's always going to be DC there as long as the, the amplifier is on or should be there. So I'm more of a DC offset guy, but you have multiple options. So on all of our analog amplifiers, you have a switch to turn to pick the mode you want. On VXI products, you're actually going to do that in Tune software. So by going to the setup tab in Tune, Clicking two little arrows next to the inputs label at the top there will open up a drawer where you have the ability to select remote DC offset or signal sensing to wake up your VXI amplifier. Moving on to input sensitivity. Real quick, it's slightly truncated, but in all of these applications, it's input number one that sensing works on. So DC offset sensing and signal sensing is looking at sig the signal on input number one. So if you're not using input number one, those aren't going to work. So <laughs> make sure we've had a number of calls with our um, our DSP based product, which is a setting like what Rob just shared with us, where people were complaining, "How come this thing won't turn on?" It's like, are you using input one and two? Well, no, you have to if you're using signal sensing. The amp needs to be able to see something on input one. Sorry, Rob. Nope, all good. Um, again, we have low input and high uh, input volt switch options on all of our analog amplifiers. I'm going to get into that when we actually talk about the level setting and when you may need to, to use each of those settings. And then, of course, we have that potentiometer. Again, in VXI and MVI, it's all done in our software package, Tune Software. So again, on the Setup tab, you're going to click those two arrows that would be next to the inputs title if the drawer wasn't open up. And instead of a dial, you're actually going to use drop-down menus and color-coded indicators that will let you know how strong the signal is, if it's strong and clean, or if we're overdriving the inputs. 
When it comes to determining what our inputs are, uh, the input mode option really is nice for flexibility. Maybe you have an eight channel amplifier, but your source only has left right audio out. So do you use a bunch of Y splitters and split your signal and lower input levels and add potential noise? You don't have to. Just move that switch to two channel and the amp knows to route all of the left inputs to the four left output channels the right input to the four right output channels, and if it's four inputs or eight inputs, whatever it may be, it routes it properly. Again, in the digital side for MVI and VXI products, that's all done through Tune Software with our input mixer. Um, it's all done automatically for you if you use our setup tool, or you can do it yourself where you can determine exactly which input goes to which output, create mono channels, whatever you want. Um, again, just further, um, further advances the flexibility of input mode on the VXI and MVI products through Tune. And now let's talk about setting filters. Again, pretty common on an analog amp. You uh, have your uh, potentiometer there to pick the filter frequency and depending on the model amplifier, high pass or low pass filter, and some models even ask if you want a 12 or 24 dB per octave slope. So again, VXI, MVI, all done in Tune software. On the Tune tab, you'll have a crossovers panel in the bottom left corner, and there for every output channel, you can pick your filter frequency for high pass on the left, low pass on the right. You can pick the slope you want, and there's even those cool little orange bars to the right that we call uh, quick view passband bars that give you an idea what the uh, filters are doing on that specific channel. So um, just some of the kind of difference. Don't this, Rob. So many people get confused about an analog amp versus a DSP amplifier. And I think there's some magic thing going on with DSP that's totally different. And you showing it like this, I think is fantastic. They're equal, it's the same thing. If, but instead of a physical switch, you have an electronic thing that you just adjust and you can put in any number. It's just more flexible. It's the same thing. Yeah, I know it's, you know, when I, I always, you know, we joke when we've done some of our DSP trainings that when we mention DSP, people look at us like we're speaking about this voodoo, dark arts, black magic form of sorcery when really it's everything we've done our entire career in the analog world. It's just done on a computer, yields great, greater flexibility and lets us do a couple other cool things as well. So uh, it, it is all the same. It's just being done with a, a different tool or piece of hardware, if you will. And that also goes for bridging outputs of our amplifiers. Um, on all non-DSP amps, so our analog family, uh, if you want to bridge your amplifiers, it's pretty easy. You connect your, uh, in this case, channel one positive and the channel two negative wires. So instead of going channel one positive, channel one negative, we would do channel one positive, channel two negative, ignore the, uh, the middle two, if you will, and we have a bridged, bridged output, very easy. And it's really easy in the software as well for VXI and MVI products. By clicking that little bridge, that little icon, that little square under the bridge column, that's going to make a combined channel now. You'll notice it says bridged output G slash output H. You'll notice it's a larger view. And if you look closely, you'll see those two arrows are pointing to the wires you're going to connect. So remember, VXI and MVI, we have color-coded harnesses for our outputs. They're lettered and colored. So this is telling us we're going to connect G positive to H negative. G positive is blue, H negative is gray and black, and forget those other ones. We grade them out so you don't even have to worry about them. So the process is the same on the software side of things. It's not this magical stuff that's going on. We're just doing it through a computer, and I think that's pretty nice. I like to do this while I'm sitting in the car and not in a trunk, bent over halfway, trying to, you know, do, get to a bunch of stuff. So I love that aspect of the DSP. So um, there is some of that too. So now that we kind of covered some of the basics, let's get into the actual setup. And uh, these are some recommended uh, starting points that our technical support team has come up with. And if you've contacted them for information, you've probably heard this straight from their mouths or keyboards as well. So starting with high pass filters, um, Usually, uh, the most commonly common application for a high-pass filter is probably in a, in a passive speaker system. We have a pair of component speakers with that standalone passive crossover network or a coaxial that has some sort of filtering in line on the tweeter. In those types of systems, a high-pass filter of 80 hertz is a great starting point. That's where we want you to start. And you can you know, go up a little if you want. We don't recommend going down. Remember, as we start lowering our frequencies, as we lower the octaves, we're asking that speaker to move a lot more to put out that same equal energy. 
And again, if you have the option, a 24 dB Linkwitz Riley filter is always a good starting point because when you combine two of those filters together, they will sum electrically flat. So you have that flat electrical response again. If you're using an active system, so these would be great starting points on our D, uh, VXI, uh, MVI product, even XDV2, those five channel XD amps, you can configure into a three-way system where you can high pass tweets, band pass your mid-range and low pass your subwoofers. You don't have the extra flexibility for levels and EQ like VXI, but you can go active, which I'm always all about. In an active system, a high pass filter again at 80 hertz for the mid bass drivers is a great starting point. 400 hertz for the mid range and 5000 hertz for the tweeters. And again, if you actually use a VXI product and use our setup tool, these are the exact frequencies the setup tool is going to give you. So, Rob, if um, I may jump in real quick on that, um, the guidelines that you just shared with us, these are really great starting points. You may also find that they're really great ending points too. But these are not set in stone. These are really good places to start to make sure that your initial setup is dialed in really well. Now we do do a separate uh, course of training that we call our DSP amplifier course that actually goes through the entire process of setting up a DSP based amplifier and goes all the way through how to tune that to make sense of what those filter frequencies might change to be like uh, when you're done tuning. So if you're interested in learning more about that, take a look for those videos or look for a future class on those. Thank you, Steve. Moving on to the low pass filter side, again, the most common application is going to be on subwoofers. Again, low pass filter at 80 hertz. So we're only having 80 hertz down going to the subs with the 24 dB per octave Linkwitz Riley filter is always a great place. And if we are going active, so we don't have those standalone passive crossover networks to protect the uh, our speakers. Um, low pass filter of 400 hertz down for your mid range drivers, or a 400 hertz down for your mid base drivers, and 5000 hertz for the mid range drivers will give you those combined pass bands that we would want for when you combine them with a the high pass to give us the frequency response for each driver. So those are good points to start. Once your filters are set, now we can get into actually setting the levels on the amplifier. And we are gonna need a couple of tools. We're gonna need test tones because we never set levels with music. We already kind of talked about that. It's the beautiful thing of a sine wave is it's consistent. And it's always, I look at it, it's always gonna be the worst case scenario because it, it, it's con consistent frequency at a consistent level. So it's always gonna, when you set levels with a sine wave, if you do it to your max non-clipped output, it's pretty much always gonna be the max. I highly doubt you're gonna get consistent music unless you're clipping the snot out of it or something that's gonna get into this area. It's always important to make sure that you um, have sine waves that are not attenuated and not compressed. So if you don't have access to like our fix CD, which has all the tones on it, we do have um, files that you can download from our help center. If you go to jlaudio.com, click on support, there's an art article under the car audio section called audio files where we have different frequency sine waves, um, pink noise, but make sure you don't compress them also. Don't run them through iTunes or Apple Music because any file that compresses will remove some content as well. So try to keep it as a wave format on a USB stick and we want frequency appropriate. So we don't want to play 5000 hertz for a subwoofer. We'd want 50 hertz on a subwoofer. We'd want one kilohertz for mid range because that's the spectrum that it's going to be in. We're going to need an oscilloscope or a digital voltmeter. In a perfect world, we would have an oscilloscope. We could plug it in, play a sine wave, and turn up input sensitivity. What's cool about a scope, remember that sine wave chart we saw earlier? That's what an oscilloscope would show us. As we start turning up the levels, the wave would get bigger, and we would actually start to see it square off and clip. So you just back it off until it doesn't show that and you're done. But as scopes are expensive, we don't all have them. And that's where the trusty digital multimeter comes in. Kevin has a joke. There's probably a free one in your Harbor Freight ad. Go and buy a dollar worth of nails and you'll get a free voltmeter. So it's very easy to get one and it's actually really easy to set levels with a voltmeter. And that's really what we're gonna focus on for our analog amps. If we are using a VXI or MVI product, as we kind of talked about already, uh, we just need our tune software. We're not gonna need a meter for that. We're gonna use sine waves and tune to set our levels. So how do we set levels using a voltmeter? We're gonna set the output to a specific AC voltage, but how do you know what AC voltage the amp should be? Well, it's actually really easy if you know what the amplifier's rated power for that channel is and what the resistance is. What's the load of the speakers? And I put final speaker load on there because it is the final load. If we have two four ohm woofers wired up into a two ohm load, the two ohm load is what matters there. So 
voltage, what we want our amp to put out AC is actually a really easy equation to figure out. It's the square root of the rated power times the resistance. So let's try it out. Let's say we have an RD or JD 500 slash one amplifier, a mono block that's rated for 500 watts at two ohms. And we have two, I don't know, 10W0 V3 subwoofers. That's a single four ohm coil, but we're gonna wire them up together and have a two ohm load. So knowing that voltage is the square root of power times resistance, all we need to do is find out the square root of 500 times two, that's a thousand. The square root of 1000 is 31.6. So my output voltage, when I turn up the input sensitivity, I'm gonna turn it up until my meter reads 31.6 volts AC. That's how easy it is. Yes, Steve? Hang on, hang on, hang on, wait, hold on, hold on. Hold on. You're dealing with AC voltage, but you're talking resistance and stuff. Are you doing some goofy things with numbers and science? You said this was a science and physics class. I just wanna make sure that the haters out there aren't gonna start screaming at us that we're kind of mixing things together here. Can you explain that a little bit? Well, there's some things called um, Ohm's law. There's the power law. And that's what's beautiful about it because they're laws. They're not theories, they're not ideas, it's black and white. The thing with Ohm's law is, you know, your, your voltage, resistance, and current are all tied to one another. If you know two of those, you can figure out the third. And if you have that information, we can also then tie that into the power laws. Where again, if we know power and resistance, we can figure voltage. If we know power and voltage, we can figure this. So they're all tied together. These are laws of physics. It's black and white. It's science 101. There's no gray area about it. And I love it because it's easy. When I grab my multimeter that you told me I needed to use, if I put it on ohms on there and I put it on my speaker, I'm not seeing four ohms. I'm not seeing, I'm seeing some other weird numbers. So <laughs> do, do these numbers actually work out? Cause I don't know, some weird people are gonna call us on this, so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you gotta remember as, as the speaker is playing, the impedance is gonna vary on it as voltage travels through, remember. It's, they're all tied together. So as voltage changes, the, the resistance of the speaker is gonna change. But the overall- It's not actually resistance, it's impedance because it's AC and that's where I wanted to go with it. So just so everybody is, is clear on what Rob is sharing, it's an excellent method to set levels on an amplifier if you don't have some more expensive equipment. And the reason I was kind of having some fun with it is technically the math is, is fudging things a little bit. We're, we're taking some assumptions. We're assuming that the head unit is not clipping at the level that we set it at. We're assuming that a two ohm or a four ohm speaker is what it says it is. We know that this is not always gonna be the case, but setting it blindly by eye or by ear, or doing it this way, this is worlds better. You're already making too many assumptions the other way. So allow us to have some flexibility here that a four ohm speaker is four ohms. We know it's not. And that, that, that we're, we're talking about resistance and impedance as if they're the same. We know that they're not. But this method is a really elegant way of getting ideal performance from a system without expensive tools or equipment. So it's kind of neat. Yep. Thank you, Steve. So one more example real quick. Uh, we have a, a full range amplifier that's rated for 75 watts at four ohms and we have a pair of component speakers. So same thing, we're just gonna figure out what 75 times four is, well that's 300. Square root of 300 comes out to 17.3. So again, playing a one kilohertz sine wave, we would turn up the input sensitivity on that full range amplifier until we have 17.3 volts. And that should be very close to that non-clipped max output potential of the amplifier. So a very easy way to get that dialed in. There's some other ways to determine voltage as well to do this process. Uh, all of our amplifiers have it in their manual. So we'll give you the four ohm, two ohm, bridged AC voltages you may need. Uh, if you're like a lot of people and the first thing you do when you open the box is throw the manual away, you can also get all of those on our help center. Again, jlaudio.com, click on support link. Under car audio is the amplifier level setting guide. And there we have the recommended output voltages for all of our amplifiers at four ohm, at two ohm, at bridged, uh, you know, mono, uh, whatever you need may be there. And there's actually a really good video linked embedded in that article by a very good looking, talented trainer that will actually walk you through the steps we're gonna talk about right now. So, 
After we know what our AC voltage needs to be, this is how we're gonna actually set the level on the amplifier. Step number one is disconnecting all speakers from the amplifiers, because we don't want sine waves going through our speakers, they'll probably rock it through the doors. And uh, that's where that mechanical <laughs> issue comes into play. So disconnect the speakers and we're at- once. Yeah. <laughs> and you're actually gonna insert the probes from your meter into the speaker outputs and tighten them down into place. So if this was just on a full range amplifier, we would put our probes into positive and negative on one pair of outputs. We're gonna make sure on our source unit that it's flat. We want no processing. So turn off any boost, make sure treble and bass are flat, your fader and balance are centered. We want a pure signal to work with. The next thing you're gonna do is turn your source unit to three quarter volume. And Steve mentioned this earlier. This is kind of a, you could look at it as a gray area. In a lot of cases, three quarter volume is gonna be a good place to start for a clean, uh, high output non-clip signal. Some source units, uh, especially factory ones like a Dodge for example, they tend to actually clip around three quarter volume. So if you follow these steps, your levels are perfect, but the system sounds like it's distorting, turn down the volume on the source unit, reset your levels again. So it's not perfect, perfect world we'd have an oscilloscope, so we have visual access to all of this. But again, this is a, uh, you know, there, I don't want to say gray area, but it's a great area to start to make sure we have it reliable and we can lower the volume and redo it if it doesn't sound the way we want and we follow the proper steps. So we're going to play that frequency specific sine wave at three quarter volume and then slowly turn up the input sensitivity potentiometer until our uh, voltmeter says the output voltage we wanted. So if we wanted 31.6 volts, we're gonna slowly turn it up until it says 31.6 volts. But what happens when your potentiometer is turned all the way down and the voltmeter is exceeding what it says? So we want 31.6 volts, the potentiometer is all the way down and it's reading 50 volts. What the heck's going on? Oh, that's where that high level switch comes into play. On all of our amplifiers, other than VXI and MVI, we have that low and high level switch. MVI, VXI, you don't have to worry about low level, high level. They have can accept up to 16 volts of input and it's all managed digitally with the DSP chips. So if you find at very low potentiometer levels or nothing, you're exceeding your target voltage, move the switch to high. That means we have a very high level signal coming in and then redo the process and that should allow you to get you dialed in where you wanna be. So a very easy process for our analog amps. It's even easier when you start working with the RD and JD amps, because we're gonna follow the same steps of disconnecting the speakers, make sure there's no processing, we're gonna play that sine wave at three quarter volume, but this time we're gonna slowly turn up the levels until that clipping indicator turns on. And when that clipping indicator kicks on, you're at your max non-clipped output, and it is, ridiculously accurate. A couple years ago when we came out with RD, um, we had a cool demo at our suite at the Palms where we had a uh, RD501 with a sine wave going into it hooked up to a uh, Picoscope, which is a computer-based oscilloscope program. And as we turned up the potentiometer, you would actually see the sine wave get larger and larger. And once that clipping indicator came on, we had a nice, big, perfect sine wave. And if we started to turn it up a little more after that, you would start to see the wave flatten. We would start to see some of those flat clipping uh, motions we saw on that image earlier. So that was really cool to show how accurate that is. We also, on the RD and JD amps, there it is. That's an awesome little tool for a uh, computer-based oscilloscope. RD and JD, we also have bass boost that we need to worry about. So if you are going to do boost, please, not as much. We've had that conversation in, pre in previous sessions. But figure out how much boost you're going to use and then set your levels. If we boost after the fact, we're probably going to start ex easily exceeding that output potential of the amplifier. So if you add boost, you're going to need to revisit your levels. Just be aware of that. Again, setting levels on the DSP amps, a very easy process. We're gonna, this time though, since we use harnesses on MVI and VXI, we're actually in Tune Software, we're just gonna mute all the outputs. We don't have to disconnect everything, which is really nice. So you're gonna master mute the amplifier. Again, make sure your source unit is perfectly flat. You're gonna play that sine wave, but now 
there's no dials or switches on MVI and VXI. We're gonna to go to that uh, menu I showed you earlier and we're gonna pick the largest number in that drop down menu that gives you a solid yellow or amber signal strength indicator. So if you pick eight and it's yellow, try going to nine. Is nine's yellow? Great, try 10. If we go to 10 and we're starting it's solid red or we see some yellow red flickering, go back down a level and that will be your max non-clipped output for in terms of input sensitivity. I think one thing that's important to remember I didn't discuss earlier on input sensitivity, it's not a volume knob. Every amplifier has its max output potential and all input sensitivity is saying is, how sensitive do I need to be based on what's coming in to hit my max output? It's not like we're just gaining it. The amp's gonna put out what it's gonna put out. It just needs to know how hard it needs to work based off of what's coming in. So this is where I like having the levels with VXI because you know you can actually see when we're overdriving the inputs. That might not mean we're clipping the outputs depending on what you know what we're listening to or how loud it may be. But if you see red flickering or solid red, just go down one number and your inputs will be properly set. So, so the whole goal here, just as a summary of what Rob just shared, is when your input signal is nearing its maximum, your output signal from the amp should be nearing its maximum too, so everything scales accordingly. So a lot of people, what they'll do is they'll have a small input signal and they'll just crank up the input sensitivity until they get full output, but then they turn up the volume on the source unit and wind up clipping the hell out of the amplifier. They've overdriven it because it's too sensitive. It's, you've set it improperly, and that's where a lot of the problems come in. So, you know, they, that explanation of, of, of setting it the way Rob shared with us is a great way of thinking about it, that it's just too sensitive to that signal uh, and it's reaching its full potential before it really should. Um, there's all kinds of innuendo type jokes that could be made about what I just shared and I'll let you have some fun with that. But essentially that's what you're doing. You're trying to set the, the input level of the amplifier to get the maximum output. And uh, the other thing I like about the three quarter position that Rob shared with us is most people, when they're listening and enjoying their audio system, they live right around three quarter. So you're getting a whole bunch of power and it's still pretty darn clean at three quarter. And if you go up a little bit higher, that's your little bit of clipping. And that's okay. That's the kind of clipping that I'm okay with. And just be more sensitive on the high frequency stuff, as we mentioned earlier. But if you set everything up, as Rob just indicated, where everything is reaching that same point, that three quarter level, as you go above three quarter, that's a little bit of extra love that's going to make it clip a little bit. But that little bit is a heck of a lot better than clipping early on. So let's just say your, your volume control goes from zero to 100, just to make the numbers easy. If you do it at 75, you're right where Rob said. But if you did it at 25, every click above that is going to start getting you closer and closer and then well into clipping. You've got a whole bunch of range to really overdrive that amp. And that, that's where our warranty department stays very busy, you know, because that's, of course, the manufacturer's defect. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I hope at the end you guys see the importance uh, of setting levels and, you know, it. I always, obviously I'm biased, I work for JL Audio, but it always drives me nuts when people say, oh, your product's junk, it breaks, it but it doesn't last, but, but I mean, if your stuff's dialed in, it's going to last. You know, we, we design pretty robust products, there's a reason why we're a little more conservative on our ratings, but at the end of the day, if you're running a, just an absolute pure clip signal, I don't care what you're running, it's gonna damage or break over time. There's only so much, uh, you know, small copper coil can take in a, uh, in a full range speaker and how much movement a speaker has. So, you know, it's probably one of the most overlooked aspects of our industry, I feel, whether it's, you know, on the professional side or the DIY side is getting the amp set up. It's not as easy as turning it up and yep, sounds about right. Cause there's no visual indication. And like Steve, you know, we were kind of joking about earlier, you know, it, it is all Ohm's law and the power law. These are laws of physics and they are what they are. And if we follow them, you're going to have a great sounding system. That's going to be reliable. That's that's it. You know, we, we, we were kidding around earlier. You know, you started off saying we're going to get into some science and physics and I kidded around that, you know, that scares people. But what, what makes me comfortable about sharing something like that is we it doesn't matter what shirts we're wearing. All of this stuff applies across the board. Um, the, the equation that Rob shared about the, the, the square root of power and resistance and all that other stuff. All of that will follow through to just about any other product that you're going to work with. And I say just about because 
look, you guys know there's lots of different product on the marketplace. And most of the stuff that you're likely to be dealing with, if you're watching this, obviously you like our stuff, but any product that you would compare favorably with ours is probably also going to be very good. And you could trust a lot of the ratings. What we're trying to avoid is that 5,000 watt amplifier with a built-in alarm for 200 bucks. We know that that's not true power rating. So everything else that Rob shared with a quality product, you can look at their numbers and actually use the same formulas across the board. And that's where science, physics, and math all come in because that's universal. That's not a language that only is spoken by J.O. Audio. That's something that everybody can work with. And that's what I really like about this. This, this course is about amplifier configuration and it's truly that it's amplifier configuration, not just JL audio amplifier configuration. Yes, the examples we use our product because we have access to that and this is a JL audio training, but ultimately the concepts that Rob shared with us, they, they are completely universal. And it, obviously we get excited about that because we can speak openly and freely and not have to make sure that we're saying the exact things that we're supposed to. This is easy. We just talk science and it's easy ish. <laughs> yeah, ish. <laughs> there was something that came up. I'm not sure if Kevin's going to bring it up. I saw it in the, the chat there and I thought it was funny. And it, it was from Glenn Savage, of course, right? Glenn is awesome. Again, if you don't know who he is, he runs a shop up in Georgia there and he does incredible work. He's a fantastic dude. And he was kidding around when Rob was talking about setting input sensitivity on a VXI amplifier. And he made the comment, not with optical. <laughs> <laughs> and he's right, he's optical. It's not voltage, it's optical. So it's not a sensitivity, it's it's constant. It's always the same, it's zeros and ones. So there's nothing to set. It's full bits all the time, really is what it comes down to. And in that case, the other thing that Rob shared with us on a DSP-based amplifier is you have the ability to set the output of the amplifier. And not in this case, you wouldn't be setting the input because there's nothing to be sensitive to. So that's where you would uh, set your levels and all of the other things. And that, that would be a true gain structure like Rob was referring to. I actually saw there was a good question on Facebook about uh, setting input sensitivity on a tweak. And that's actually something that's good to bring up as well because a standalone DSP product like tweak does have its own input sensitivity as well. So if you're using a standalone tweak product with, uh, I think in this case it said you had HD amplifiers, you would follow the same steps, but except we would set the input level sense input sensitivity on the tweak first, which is going to be very similar to what I showed you for the VXI and MVI product. Instead of the dots, it's a VU bar. So you would want to be in the yellow bars, not the red. And then also you need to set your output levels. So we want to hit our max non-clipped output of the DSP. Then we can go and follow do the, the setting on the amplifier. If we don't set the DSP first and get the input and output properly configured, all of our levels are going to get screwed up more and more as we go downstream. So standalone products, get your, your input and output styled in, then you can start addressing the amplifiers. Right on, right on, very good. Hey guys, I have a, I, I accidentally got uh, Jeffrey's question mixed up on the inputs and the outputs, so I figured I would just answer him. I answered him for setting input sensitivity on a VXI. Um, he was asking about getting the outputs uh, uh, laid out on there and if unplugging the speaker harness is uh is okay to do that and then checking the clipping indicators on the output and yes you can do that um however you could listen to it at a, at a higher level for a second and just check it out um setting the outputs i would probably do with music like a, a more in, intense music rather than doing a tone anyway um because when i'm doing my levels personally and this is uh you know, when I'm doing my levels on the outputs, it's actually the last thing I'm doing. I've gone through, I've tuned the system, and I'm I'm working through that tuning process. My inputs are set. Maybe all my EQing is done at that point in time. And then I'm going through and I'm listening to the system, and I'm going through and making some level adjustments for the uh, speakers using that output level trim. Um, so, yes, you can unplug the harness if you want to. Um, you can measure that output if you want to. However, honestly, you're probably going to do a lot of that output level trim by ear at that point in time and using the output clipping indicators in the uh, Tune software. How dare you make a mistake, Kevin? <laughs> what are we going to do with that guy? <laughs> such a train of thought with input sensitivity <laughs> questions. Yeah. <laughs> the output one threw me off there. <laughs> 
And that is the unique thing with the DSP based stuff is you know, even with the Cartoon Express app, which is designed to treat a VXI or MVI product like a regular amplifier where it's just crossover and levels, but you still have that output trim option as well to make sure you're getting every little bit of performance out of the amplifier without having to, to get into the harder uh, you know, EQ and stuff if you're not familiar with that. To set the gain from, there's another Tweak 88 question from Louie there. And I, he's just trying to wrap his head around it and I can, uh, I can understand. Um, to set the gain from my Tweak 88 to my HD amps for let's say C7s, do I set the gain with the Tweak 88 set to full range setting the frequency cut for the c7 c7 uh tweeter or would i set the frequency first on the tweak 88 and then set the gains for his amplifiers or on the uh tweak so he's asking if he should set the high pass and low pass filters first then do the input and output sensitivity on his tweak or should he run his tweak full range set the input sensitivity and then go through and set his high pass and low pass filters i would typically set the filters first and then use a frequency that's appropriate for the band that you're playing. So if you set your high pass filter at 5,000 Hertz, don't play a 1,000 Hertz tone. Play something higher than 5,000 if it's a high pass, right? And similarly for your mid range, make sure you play something that's within the pass band and preferably something that's kind of far away from the actual filter frequencies. As you saw in Rob's chart that there's a tapering that happens above and below the filter frequencies of, of either a high pass or a low pass filter. Um, so you want to make sure you stay a bit away from that. Um, it's hard to give you a specific number without knowing what the filters are and all that other stuff. But if you have a pass band like Rob recommended from 400 to 5K, uh, 1000 would be fine. It's in the middle there and it's okay. Um, I would avoid something like 500 or 4000 because that's too close to the turn frequency. So you just want to stay somewhere in the middle, somewhere where the flat spot would be on a, um, a predicted response. Uh, but I would set the filters first. And I did send out the uh, audio track files for everybody on uh, Facebook there. So if they want to uh, download those, they are more than welcome. And in, those, in those active systems, one thing to be very careful with, though, is that tweeter. Um, you know, I would almost say you probably don't need to do much on the input side. We only really need a couple of watts to really be effective with the tweeter. So you could probably almost leave it at minimum and just use your output to get it balanced with the mid range. And if, you know, trim's not enough, maybe then, yeah, you know, on a tweak or VXI, you boost it up one notch and then look at the output trim again. But on a tweeter, you really don't need to get your max, you know, dialed in for max output potential because you're really only gonna use a fraction of that power to really make the tweeter do what it needs to do. Yeah, right on. That's a really good point, Rob, because I think a lot of people uh, misunderstand the, the whole level setting procedure. The method that we just outlined is the way to get the maximum output of the amplifier, which may not be what you want, but what we're trying to determine is the maximum that you should ever set it at. And if you if it's too much, just dial it back. But what we're trying to prevent you from doing is having it low and then trying to dial it up, because if you dial it up blindly, that's when you run into the misbehavior that we're trying to avoid. So once you set everything at its maximum level, then you start bringing it down to the level that they all blend well together. So if you have too much mid range, uh, sorry, too much high frequency relative to the mid range, bring the tweeter down. And what Rob just shared with us is in almost every case, that's what you're gonna wind up doing. A couple of watts of power into almost any tweeter is gonna be plenty loud for almost every system. So having 75 watts going to it is way overkill. And you are gonna wind up backing that thing down almost every time. And that's where, like, if you know you have more power than what your speaker is capable of handling, that's where that equation comes in. You know, what we use was, like Steve said, was for max output. Maybe we have 500 watt amp at two ohms, but our speakers at two ohms are a combined 250 watts of power. So, you know, do 200, you want 250 watts out of the amp then. We just do 250 times two, square root of that, and that voltage is what you're going to set your output to. So if you know what you want power wise, which may not always be max output, most of the time it probably will be, but if we can't handle that and we know what we want our output to be, just swap out that max output number for that. So if it's 100 watts, 200 watts, whatever it may be, multiply that by your uh, impedance, square root, 
and use that target voltage instead. I think it's a bit tricky, obviously, with dynamic music and whatnot, but if you are using sine wave, that's, uh, that's a pretty sound thing that you could do if you wanted to do that. Um, more often than not, if I think I'm going to have too much, I would simply back it down until I felt comfortable with it. Um, this, this is terrible to say because it's probably not entirely accurate, but if you're following Rob's method that he kind of outlined for us and you go through that process and set your levels carefully based on his method, even if you are technically overdriving it in terms of the raw number, you'll probably be more okay than if you did it blindly with the recommended power. Um, so be careful with what I said there. So I'm not saying everybody go run out and buy the biggest amplifier. Don't worry about it because Steve said Rob backed him up on it. It's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is if you blindly set an amplifier that's a, quote, perfect match versus if you accurately set an amplifier that's a bit larger than normal, you know, recommendation, you're probably better off with an accurate level set on a bigger amplifier than an inaccurate level set on a good match amplifier. Uh, that's the importance of proper setup. You can actually get away with a little bit more sometimes if you're carefully setting it up. It's, we just don't want you doing it blind. You know, let's have a method to it and be consistent. You know, the results are definitely worth it. Uh, more reliable systems that are going to sound better. And that's the goal. That's the whole plan here is just to get your systems to sound really, really good and be really reliable. When you go back into Glenn's shop or Mike's shop or whoever shop you're working with, or if it's your shop, you know, the, the, the goal here is to make customers smile and be happy. And when they come back, they bring friends. That's really what we want. And from a retailer point of view, we want you to sell our equipment, make it really, you know, sound great and reliable. You support us that way and everybody's happy. That, that's really what it's about. We just want a good sounding systems out there that don't break. <laughs> I don't think it's too much to ask. What do you guys think? You know? well, if you're getting yourself in trouble, Steve, there's a comment on Facebook saying you told everyone to get a VX 600 slash 2i for every pair of tweeters. <laughs> you heard it here, fellas. Yeah, Jeff. Well, we're just going to give me a number. <laughs> Brandon says he's going to put a cap on his tweets when he goes active to stay safe. That sounds like uh, something that uh, <laughs> is a good move. <laughs> so a, a lot of times, like, you know, on our C7 stuff, we do we do sell them and it comes with a cap in the box. And we do say to use the cap, not so much as a filter from low frequencies. It does help with that, of course, that's the intent of a, a capacitor when you put it on a, a Twitter that way is to filter out the lower frequency. But you still need an active filter, absolutely. You can't just rely on that because that's really intended to get rid of um, errant noises, noises that are not really part of the audio signal. Yeah, it'll show up like an audio signal, it'll be a spike in voltage, like a turn on pop or so, some other noise issues that can obliterate a tweeter if there wasn't a filter to help protect it. That's why the capacitor is there. We do strongly, strongly recommend you use that because all it takes is one errant pop or surge through that line to kill that uh, very nice tweeter. So we don't want that to happen. Yeah, the, the filter frequency on the cap that comes with the C7 is pretty low. It's like in the 2,500-ish uh, range there. So it's not, like Steve said, it does filter out some of the lower, but you can't use that specifically for the uh, the filtering of the tweeter. It is there just for that protection. Uh, and to put that into context, just to kind of speak into a little bit more, a capacitor in line with a tweeter, uh, the, the filter itself, if you were to analyze it, it's about a 6 dB per octave filter. So if the filter frequency is at 2,500, that means it's only 6 dB down at 1,300, one octave down from that point. More or less, I'm speaking kind of generally here, but that's still a lot of energy at a fairly low frequency for a tweeter. So you'd want something you know steeper and active at usually a higher frequency. Often is the firmware updated for fix 82 and VXI? Should we update? <laughs> Not very often is the answer. And uh, the, the best thing to do is if you connect your, uh, your amplifier to tune software and your computer is connected to the internet, it'll let you know if the firmware is out of date and guide you through the update process. And where we stand right now with, uh, especially on the VXI amplifiers, if it's fairly current, it's not like really old, if it's fairly current, that update process is just a matter of pushing the files of the amplifier. There's very little else that you have to do. Um, if you need any guidance with that, contact our technical department. They can definitely walk you through that process. But it's it doesn't happen very often. I think we've only done it three times ever. Yeah, three or more on VXI. Yeah. So it's it's, it's uncommon. Um, but yeah, we we do recommend keeping it up to date. There's uh, very often performance improvements 
uh, reliability improvements that are built into there and user improvements, which is uh, kind of a big one for me. Jeffrey's making fun of Rob. He says that uh, thanks for entertaining the questions and occasional bad jokes. So the bad jokes are all about you because my jokes are wonderful. Thanks. I'll be here next week. <laughs> <laughs> Tech support's always your uh, your front line. They're very very smart guys. They're enthusiasts. Car, marine, home, you name it. They're they're dialed in and they'll do a great job helping you with. Uh, set up troubleshooting tech you name it they are there enclosure design so take advantage of them system design all day long i like them. i think uh, system design and enclosure design are their two their two favorites not a doubt we'll get some <laughs> of the exercise their brain matter right brandon when is the next talk i don't want to be late this time <laughs> i'm keeping track of you brandon <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we have anything on the car side officially scheduled yet. I know we uh, we definitely tried to change the times up with the ones this week to see what uh, worked best for you guys. Um, and uh, we have some cool ideas for some upcoming trainings. And uh, once we have information on that, we'll uh, definitely work with our marketing marketing team and social media teams to make sure that information is shared to you guys via uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, however we get that out to you. So just keep an eye out. And we also try to make sure we share them on the jail for life group and the jail dealer groups and other industry groups for those uh, that do work in 12 volt. So just uh, keep your eyes out and we'll uh, let you know when the next ones are coming up. Excellent. Thanks for that, Rob. It's a good segue to remind everybody if there's certain content you want to hear from us or certain days of the week that are better for you or a certain time of day that's better for you. Let us know, because uh, as we get into the groove here, we have a lot of different sessions that we can offer. We'd like to know what you're looking for and when is best for you to, to enjoy that, that content. Uh, Glenn is pushing for an after dark thing, which could be a little bit more casual, uh, probably sometime in the early evening on the East Coast, which will be in the late afternoon for the West Coast, so kind of a nice little hybrid. Uh, that's something that we're entertaining because we've heard that from a number of people. But if you feel so strongly about a certain day of week or a time of day or a topic that you really want us to cover in depth or or even just uh, on a overview uh, situation, let us know. That's uh, we're looking for it. So uh, again, we're always here to help you in any way we can. Our tech guys are always available. Um, you know, Kevin, Rob, and I we're here to take any questions we possibly can. 